when you look ahead, what is your biggest legislative priority moving forward? You know, I think probably I would say a continuation of good policy that we really got off to a really good start this year. Um, continuing with our health care initiatives that um, also embrace mental health is a big, it's been a big priority for us over the years. And certainly we continued that. Um, certainly public safety will continue to be um, front and center. Education, we've, um, we're, we've been great supporters of, of higher education and K through 12. And we've added another layer now as we look at um, making sure that pre-K is an important part and is well uh, funded and well supported in our state. And we know that if you get started early, then you finish stronger. So education, those, those things are, are, are very much important to us. And certainly another, I'll add this one. We're gonna look, take a, a really close look this summer at energy. It's so important to the continued success of our state from economic development and a quality of life perspective. It's one of the things that makes Georgia really attractive to the country is, is um, we've been very successful. But we'll continue to look at a, a broad spectrum. We like to think we can talk about anything in the house. You've been in Georgia politics for decades. Yes. How have Georgia politics changed over that time? Oh, well, that's a good question. Um, I think not, uh, really a, a lot's changed, but a lot remains the same. I think Georgia has always been a forward-looking state. I think that's pretty evident by um, our standing in the South, but also in the country. We've always uh, been embraced um, a standard of living that's improved by good job opportunities all across our state. And certainly that's been emphasized, though, in the last few years, certainly under Governor Kemp's leadership, that is, uh, it's been prioritized, and certainly uh, Governor Deal and, and Governor Purdue, but the, the last few years has been really prioritized that we bring opportunities from the mountains to the sea in Georgia. And so that's been, a, I think that's one of the changes we see, a really a recognition there have potentially we've grown into two Georgias, a rural Georgia and a more urban Georgia, but we're, I think we're seeing some of that level out. Georgia's become a major political battleground state around the country. We hear a lot from voters that there is a frustration with the partisanship they see, particularly at the national level. Being the Speaker of the House here in Georgia, how do you balance the national headwinds and local priorities? Well, we believe that a good idea can come from any place, Zach, in the House, and we'll, we'll consider a good idea whether it comes from from our Democratic members, our Republican members, and we'll consider those. But, you know, one of the things we like to do in the House, and I think that's what separates us a little bit from what goes on in Washington, is we like to deal with facts. Then we, then we develop good common sense conservative ideas based on those facts. And facts, and I think that's where our policy comes from, and I believe that's one of the reasons that, that you know, Georgia has changed demographically in a, in a pretty significant way from 20 years ago. But uh, we still feel like the message that, um, that is beneficial to Georgia families, issues that they discuss around the kitchen table, and we are addressing those issues and we're making a difference. And we do that most of the time in a bipartisan manner, but we all, there's also some partisan politics in Georgia. And we know that, and we, and, but I think we are respectful of ideas and opinions. Lastly, we demonstrate that in the House because we let everyone have their say. We hear, hear everyone out, we go through a process, that um, through the committee process and then on the floor that allows us to thoroughly discuss ideas that are important to Georgians. There were a number of people in the 2022 elections who voted for both Governor Brian Kemp and Senator Raphael Warnock. Is Georgia a state where voters still make up their own minds independently? I think that's a great point. I think you're right on that. Um, uh, when you look at that, that is, make that assumption, Yes, I think Georgia is still, you know, we, we st certainly are a, um, do align ourselves with parties in Georgia. There's, um, there's, there certainly is a part of whom we are, and we certainly, um, the different parties bring um, a different um, beliefs, if you will, and, and values to the table, and, and that's important for our citizens to make sure they, they align themselves. You always align yourselves with your neighbors to a point, and folks that see the world as you do. Uh, but yes, I, but I do think that, um, we have always, in Georgia, uh, voted for the person more than the party. And I don't think that's any change in that. I want to circle back to something you mentioned about looking at and prioritizing energy here in the state of Georgia. 
It was recently announced that the electric vehicle manufacturer Rivian is pausing its plans to open a multi-billion dollar plant here in Georgia. How does that announcement impact the state's economy? Well, I, you know, if, if Rivian were our only option, it would be a huge impact. But what we're seeing with Hyundai and the metal plant down in southeast Georgia, what we're seeing with SK in this same area in northeast Georgia, with, with Kia in, in west Georgia, we see these opportunities and with, with, the, with the economic development successes we're having here, attracting good paying jobs, good quality jobs to our state, clean jobs and, and, and manufacturing jobs. Uh, I, you know, even though we would like to see, and we have a great site. The Rivian site is a great site. And we certainly hope that things work out with Rivian. And um, I'm sure they probably will. But if, if not, we still have a great site that will be very attractive to a, some sort of industry that will be, make a, be a big impact on our state. The company has emphasized that in their view, this is a pause. It's not a termination of their plans. Do you believe that assurance? Yeah, I think, you know, you know the future, we've seen a lot with, with, with in the uh, EV manufacturing and the marketing over the last few years with the, a focus from the uh, federal government and, and pushing those initiatives forward very quickly. Um, I believe that, that transition occurs gradually. I don't think you can make transitions that are as significant as changing um, the combustion engine to all electrical uh, components overnight works. So I think there was a, there's a pause, a natural business pause that says, hey, look, we want to make sure if you're, if you're a Rivian, that you um, want to make sure that the market's there. And so that's a, a um, the market for electric vehicles for EVs is maturing and that looks like the wave of the future. So, but you know, the difference in them and Hyundai, Hyundai will also in, in their metal plant will be able to produce um, internal combustion engines, uh, hybrids and EVs, at that plant. So they have, a, they're a little more diverse on their operation down in, in Southeast Georgia. In your view, what is the biggest challenge facing Georgia right now? What, we, what how do we handle all of our success? Um, you know, you know the, uh, the opportunity for, uh, to ensure that we have a, a workforce that's in place uh, to handle the challenges of the 21st century, to handle these great opportunities we have that we see in, in the number of jobs that we need in the private sector, that we need in the healthcare sector, um, educationally and, and continuing to motivate our folks to, um, our, our citizens to, uh, to reach for a, a better lifestyle by improving themselves and make sure we have a workforce that, um, that meets the demands of these great opportunities we have. I like to say along with great opportunities comes, become, comes great challenges and we're seeing that and, um, but I think we have the people uh, in this state. We also have a work ethic in Georgia that's, that's just a part of whom we are. It's embedded in our, in our citizens and I think that will serve us well and, I'm, and I feel very certain and very confident that we'll meet the challenges and be very successful in that. Here in Atlanta, we just saw almost a week of water crisis. Many people without water pressure, many people under a boil, boil water advisory for six pushing seven days. Mayor Dickens recently said it was a wake up call to the state of some aging infrastructure in the city. Does the state house have any plans to address aging infrastructure across the state? Yes, but our challenge is not only aging infrastructure, it's the need for infrastructure because of developments we have. I mean, I'll, I'll focus back on Atlanta for a second. Mayor Dickens has done an absolutely fine, wonderful job of managing this city through um, in, in his early tenure as mayor um, as in, a mar in, a, in a way that um, he's handled it remarkably well. And um, certainly I appreciate his leadership here, appreciate his friendship. Uh, infrastructure in, in cities and counties across our state and around this country certainly are a challenge. They've been in place for many years and, and with our good fortune of developing uh, good jobs and good, being a wonderful place to live, uh, stresses that infrastructure. The General Assembly and the Governor have, and we've um, invested billions of dollars in infrastructure across the state when we've seen our cities and counties not reaching, keep, keeping up with the standard of, of level of treatments in our water treatment facilities. Uh, we've, we're investing there, we we'll continually do that. We're also, um, when we look at the opportunity to provide infrastructure for drinking water, I see those projects ongoing all across the state and know personally in my district and other parts of the state where we're making tremendous investments to ensure the safety of, of um, portable drinking water for our citizens and, uh, and, and for industries they locate here. Let's circle back to some 
legislation that was part of the state budget this year. Yeah. One of the things we hear frequently from our viewers, from our audience, is that public service professions are under increasing strain trying to hire and ret retain qualified employees, particularly in law enforcement and teaching professions. The most recently passed state budget included several thousand dollars in raises, both for law enforcement officers and for teachers. Is that enough to help these professions continue to attract and retain qualified people? Yes, I know of, of, of no more critical professions to um, enhance the quality of life in our state, certainly education. Um, I think over the last few years, under Governor Kemp's leadership, we've increased teachers' pay by almost $10,000, another $2,500 this year. And we've also increased school safety to make sure when, when teachers go to school to teach our young people that um, the $45,000 per school that now is annualized in our budget will go towards giving local communities an option to address those needs, whatever they may be, whether it's a resource officer, whether it increased resource security in those school systems, but an ongoing presence in those systems supported from the state. Our public service um, officers now, Georgia State Patrol, one of the elite public safety um, groups in our country, I believe, and they do great work. Uh, Commissioner of Public Safety Billy Hitchens has stepped into the role, and that role has expanded over the years. No longer do they patrol just the state highways across our state. They're now called to be in the metropolitan areas with help with um, the metropolitan, the city police forces to um, deal with situations there. So yes, we realize there is a there's a need. We have a we don't have about 700 troopers on the road today. That number needs to be a thousand and we're going to do whatever it takes when it comes to enhancing their retirement benefits, when it comes to their pay benefits. We've, um, we're at a level now, we think we're, we're at a level that we can compete with um, Tennessee, South Carolina, and local um, police agencies, public safety agencies, and um, make sure that these trained professionals can um, support their families and be secure in their lifestyles. And I want to underscore something you just mentioned. You referenced increase money in the state budget for school safety, yes. right? Some folks have argued that in Georgia, constitutional carry was a, a major priority of Governor Brian Kemp. It's now the law of the state and it makes carrying a firearm in public a uh, completely legal thing to do. Some people have argued that that also increases the risk of a shooting involving a school. What do you say to critics who say that? So, you know, a couple of different answers for that is certainly in, in the school safety where we've, um, if you, we've hardened school security, if you will, by making entry more difficult and, and making sure that those, those entry points are, are secure and they're locked down so they're monitored and only folks that come in. And certainly we've seen um, any, any number of situations when it comes to uh, um, gun safety, uh, of course, is paramount to any Georgian. We know that. But we also have seen uh, not only the bad guys have weapons now, some folks that can also protect the good guys and have an opportunity to do just that. And so we're striking a balance here, and I think that balance is we're in a pretty good, we're in a good place there. And certainly as um, our citizens um, uh, respect each other and respect gun safety, that they're also offer protection for themselves and for those that are vulnerable around them. Can you point to some examples in Georgia where the good guys, as you put it, have been able to step up and act in a situation like that with a gun? Just in generally speaking, I can where uh, I've read, I've not experienced it personally, but I've read where any, in several opportunities, uh, several situations, I should say, not opportunities we hope, but situations that where um, someone who may maybe be a citizen that um, may have a permit, but also may be just a, a constitutional carry where they're having, they they're carry, have concealed carry. Of course, as you said, it's legal now. They've been able to step in and say, look, you know, you know just because the, the uh, bad guy has a weapon doesn't mean that someone else can't step in. Let's talk about an issue that is almost a perennial one under the Gold Dome now, sports betting. Yeah. For many years, it has been talked about that sports gambling is going to be legalized in Georgia. And for many years, advocates have said, this is our year, and it doesn't quite get over the threshold. Will Georgia in the future, in your view, legalize sports gambling? Oh, that's a good question. You probably need to ask my members that, because in the House it takes 91 votes 
to um, pass a bill and reach a majority there. And certainly we've also discussed that part of the discussion there is, is to put it on the ballot and let the people decide that it takes, um, uh, it takes two thirds majority in the House to reach that level. So um, the proponents certainly have been working. They, uh, they, they, they um, certainly have a good message and a good story to tell about the benefits of some of the receipts that will come to the state. Um, to do certain things that, especially educationally, that are important. But we also know there's another side to, to any sort of uh, sports betting or betting in general when it comes to mental health issues and, and certainly the impact it can have on families. We know all of those things have to be taken in consideration. You know, discuss, decisions like this are never simple. And you need to make sure you weigh the pros and the cons on situations like this. And certainly, um, we'll continue to have this discussion but uh, we also, um, the members certainly speak very loudly to me, and the numbers aren't there in the Georgia House to uh, pass sports betting. Taking off, if you can, your speaker hat and putting on your representative hat, personally, do you support legalizing sports gambling in Georgia? Well, it's something that I've been willing to look at over the years, and, uh, and, I, and um, I, what I've decided my posture is, We'll give it the opportunity. I won't stand in the way of it, and I won't boost it, but I'll give it the opportunity, and I'll let the people of Georgia and the members who are represented by the members in the Georgia House have their voice. You sit in a chair now here in the Georgia legislature that was once occupied by Speaker Ralston. What's it like trying to fill the shoes of somebody who was so respected by so many generations of Georgia politics? First and foremost, Speaker Ralston was a a mentor and a dear friend. Uh, learned a lot from him over the years as I, as I watched him in the chamber, watched as how he treated people, both sides of the aisle, and how he made important decisions. He did that by listening and leading from a standpoint of um, bringing in different, different voices. It's, um, you know, you can never fill the shoes of someone like David Ralston. The leadership that um, Speaker Ralston, as a man who cared deeply about rural Georgia. And I've heard that many times, that's his legacy, but his legacy was more than just caring about rural Georgia. He cared about all Georgians, all Georgians, because one of his priorities was mental health and the impact that mental health issues have on, on Georgians. Mental health issues impact every family in Georgia, I believe, not just in rural Georgia, not just in urban Georgia, but all Georgians. And, and uh, that's one of the greatest legacies that, that I've been very proud to, um, to continue to move forward is how we um, deal with mental health issues in this state. And I think Speaker Ralston would not be proud of me, but we would be proud of the House and how we continue to support his um, efforts to make sure we address those needs in our state. It sounds like you, you think about him often. I do. He, um, again, he was a friend, but he, he, was, he was somewhat larger than life. life. Uh, there's no doubt about that. And he's, you know, I think folks like Speaker Ralston, who had a, a great career in politics, but more importantly, he had a great career care, caring about people. And I saw that time after time, and I, and I was able to witness firsthand how folks embraced him and thanked him for his service and his leadership, a very balanced leadership. That's what he believed in, and certainly, I think that legacy is certainly um, part of how I conduct myself. And so um, it's been important to me and certainly we do. My wife and I, my wife, my wife Dale and I think about and talk um, from time to time and, and, uh, about David Ralston but, uh, and all the, the good times and the great accomplishments he had in Georgia. In recent years, the issue of reproductive rights and reproductive access has become front of mind, not just here in Georgia, but around the country. We've seen it a big issue in polls, a big issue in elections across the country. Georgia has what's known as the heartbeat bill. Mm -hmm. The heartbeat bill is now in effect in Georgia. It bans abortions in most cases after about six weeks of pregnancy. Do you support Georgia's heartbeat bill? I do. I, su I support um, the right to life. Um, and um, I believe we've struck a balance here that is, um, you know, is goes, um, the heartbeat bill is not satisfactory for those who believe that life begins at the, at the point of conception. We understand that. I understand that. But we also have, um, we also know that the other folks that think 
abortion could occur at any time during a pregnancy, even up to the, the point of birth. And I certainly very vehemently disagree with that. So I think we've struck a, a balance here that is um, acceptable and that, that um, is respectful of, of, of both the, the, the mothers and of life. And I think that's where we are. And we do have some exceptions in our heartbeat bill and, 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 and for a couple of areas. And I think we're in an appropriate place and I think it fits Georgia. What do you say to critics who argue that it's not the place of government to legislate how people access medical care? Well, I think it is a, um, I'm not exactly sh answer your question exactly what your intent is, but I would say that, that, that health care is a part of government because, um, and, and it's, it's part of the function of government because you and I pay taxes to the federal government and to the state government to ensure that those less fortunate than ourselves can have health care. And, and that we are, we're providing some, you know, we're providing some care for all Georgians and we're doing just that. And I believe that, that, I think that is one of the functions. And we also, we've just finished a robust conversation on providing the access to good quality health care in Georgia with our certificate of need uh, revisions that haven't been addressed in years. So we're, and, and certainly in our educational opportunities to uh, ensure that trained health care professionals are available for Georgians no matter where they live. All of those things are not just a sole function of government, it's a partnership on the private side with Mercer University, a private university that helps provide physicians. And uh, certainly those are the type of things I believe there's a, there's a combination of effort to ensure that we, we get things done. And it's, um, it's a combination of private and public. Mr. Speaker, what have I missed that you think is important? Well, not a whole lot. We've talked about a good bit. But, uh, but uh, I would say that if looking forward, I guess I'll say that, we, we want to complete the drill on a, a number of things. And, and one of them is health care, that we know we need to continue to improve health care, access to health care, and the number of physicians by opening up a new a dental school in Savannah in the near future in conjunction Georgia Southern University and the, and the Medical College of Georgia. We only have one dental school in the state, and, and our oral health is a key to our physical health. So we want to ensure that there's going to be access all over Georgia to dentists. And so we're, we're working, taking strides to do that. Um, we're also addressing issues when it comes to um, the medical profession. Uh, we'll have the first students in another partnership university with the um, Medical College of Georgia, Georgia Southern University at the Savannah campus at Armstrong um, campus, uh, where we'll admit our first group of physicians to start their training, I think 40 this fall. So we're doing a lot of things. And then we look at mental health partnerships, the partnerships we have with Mercer University, that it, the fellowships we have, those things in health care are critically important to our success as Georgia to continue to be the best place to live, work and raise a family. And I like to add, have a little fun along with that. But um, those issues, um, as we look at how we manage our energy resources and with our great partners with Georgia Power and the other providers in our state, and we just saw the the coming online of all four units at Plant Vogel this week. We want to make sure, or last week, we want to make sure that um, we help the private sector manage energy so we can, it's uh, sustainable for years to come, and so we can continue to attract good development. The last thing I'll say is, is public safety. If we aren't comfortable, or our, if our people aren't comfortable and feel safe, whether it's in the schools, and we're, we're, we're doing what we can to make that a safe place for our children and our teachers. But also, we want to ensure that um, the public is, is comfortable when they go shopping, when they go to the ball game, wherever they go. And that's a function of what one of the core missions of, of government is, and that's public safety. We're, we're taking some strides there, as I mentioned earlier. I believe we're uh, making a difference there. And uh, I think those are some of the things we want to, we've started working on, and we're going to continue down those roads. And we want to make housing safer for people in the state. When it comes, we started that process this year with the Safe, last year with the Safe at Home Act that was passed this year. But we're, and one of the things we, go, we're, we, we will do, we will work in conjunction with the state senate, Lieutenant Governor Jones of this state, and certainly Governor Brian Kemp to do the right thing by all Georgians.